I was pregnant. I was in my classroom. I remember that uh, January, top of January 2020. And I had these really intense pains um, while I was in the middle of a lesson on Basquiat. And I remember I bent over. I thought I was going into labor. And as soon as I put out one text, like six different teachers, the principal, everybody came running. They rushed me into the nurse's office, rushed, put me on my side. They were rubbing me. Um, somebody was covering my classes. Um, and I was really scared. I didn't know what to do. I'm like, I've never been pregnant before. And um, I remember someone called Trevor. They went through my phone. They called my fiance, told him to come. He actually wasn't my fiance yet. They called my boyfriend of three years. And they asked him to come and pick me up because uh, they thought I was going into labor. And my due date was February 19th, but this was January like 11th, 12th, so a month early almost. And when I got there, they, Ms. Slocum, the whole staff, they all laid back my seat in the car, brought all my stuff down. I felt really excited to be loved like that. Like, you know, I'm the art teacher, so uh, I never thought love could be like that. And then I realized it was Braxton Hicks. It was a month after I had my baby. And I really felt alone and afraid because a lot was changing. Like, I, you know, you read things about postpartum. You read things about being a first time mom. Um, my mother's in Connecticut. My mother-in-law was around the corner, but still we couldn't see her for support and for help. Um, my father-in-law did all the emergency runs to the house to help me uh, in between Trevor and myself. and. I think that was the most loneliest first month of my life, besides any other life issues that I've had. Um, because you look for people to gather around you as the, the woman and the mother, the new mother. And like, real talk, like I think, not having my mother there, I cried many a days. I would waddle down the basement with a brand new C-section. And that was not planned, the C-section was not planned. I was supposed to have a natural birth. And I would just waddle down the basement and I would go behind the furnace and I would just cry my face off because I felt so alone. Like I got a baby looking at me crying. And, you know, even though I had uh, my fiance there, he proposed on May 7th of 2020, I still felt alone for a great deal because your body is changing and you can't really explain it to somebody else without looking crazy. And there's nobody you can go to and there's doctors are only on actual phones now. You can't go in and, you know, say anything or sit down and talk to a therapist or anything like that. I'm a really big person on human interaction, face-to-face -face interaction, not digital interaction. So that was pretty scary for me. I mean, I had to relearn all of that during COVID. Like I thought about, I looked around my house at all the things I really had. And I, some stuff hadn't been out the shrink wrap. And I was like, yo, like I really had a brand new like light table, never knew it. I just bought it and I stored it away. And I thought about how much, not money I wasted, but how much money I invested in myself and never really invested in myself. Cause I bought all these things on an investmental thought, but not really in action. And I think that COVID really gave us a chance to look around our house and find ourselves. Like if you didn't, like. I remember seeing a post where they were talking about on Facebook, you know, everybody's supposed to be getting the bag during COVID and you got to become this hustler. And if you ain't develop your craft and get your money up, da 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 da, you wasted it. And I'm like, no, my coach, it was my, actually my coach from my, my program that I'm in in New York. And he was like, no, some people just needed a moment to breathe and take their time and really take a scope of what was going on around them because we've been living lives that were false, that are, um, you know, that are predicated on what other people are doing or what they're wearing or what they're saying or what they're eating. And that catapults us into a person that's not really who we are. So maybe that hustle that everybody else is doing is not what you're supposed to be doing. Maybe you are supposed to be sitting silent, redecorating your house, learning how to sew, doing something that benefits you. And I think that's what we weren't doing before. And even still, some people weren't doing it during COVID and it was okay to just sit in silence and peace. You ain't have to do nothing. You have to do shit, but just live. Try to sustain a type of life. And I think we were just all so busy trying to be busy and look busy that some of them people was not busy. So I think 
I had to learn how to go back in my studio. Since I had a baby, like I didn't definitely, like I didn't paint at all unless I was teaching a class. And before that, like my walls would be covered with all of my work and my, my designs and my screen prints. And when I had this child, like, and my son is not the reason why I didn't create anymore. It's because I wanted to stay on top of that because that's all I had. That's all I had that had to be safe. Like my paintbrushes weren't gonna catch COVID. My canvases weren't gonna catch COVID, but my son, I didn't wipe off the right amount of containers that were delivered to my door because I couldn't go out. Or if I didn't make sure Trevor took off his clothes at the back door and it went in the wash machine immediately and he didn't wash his hands before he touched me or hugged me. Like that was, that was real or touch our baby. Anything could have happened. I lost seven people during COVID, friends and family. And it became a, a, a realistic like thing in plainer terms when they started hitting closer to home. And then some of the people didn't die of COVID that I lost. I had two cousins that were murdered in Connecticut and I couldn't attend. One was hit by a car that kept going and another one was stabbed. Like, and I couldn't go to either one of those services. It had nothing to do with COVID. Then we lost somebody that did have something to do with COVID. Went in for a checkup on a limb that was worked on with surgery and came out with COVID and passed away two days later. So it's like, what were we really doing? I mean, you would like to think that people developed a sense of empathy and compassion during this time frame, but I find like people are even more selfish and nastier after COVID. Like there's a sense of entitlement, like it's mine, it's like hungry, hungry hippo concept. I don't know, I mean, I feel like we were all home at the same time. So I felt like we were all running out of space. Like everybody was in the same space. So it was like, it was like a pie that was like not enough for everybody at Thanksgiving. Everybody just sliced. We trying to slice it off and give everybody their own equal space to exist. And you know, my, my daughter has classes and I'm teaching summer courses now and she's doing dance on virtual and you know, Trevor's making emergency runs to the store and it's just like, all I wanted was to be drawn back to my work, but I couldn't get outside. I couldn't get to Michael's and this is way before curbside pickup. So it was very strenuous to, and then the baby. <laughs> Every time I even wanted to think about painting, here he goes, he needs to breastfeed and he needs to eat and I need to talk to him and we need to cool and I tried. But again, like you run out of options and you run out of opportunities to want to even do it. Like I remember waking up in the morning, my body would be aching, like literally because I fell asleep in a certain way breastfeeding him. And I would get up and I would basically try to crawl and I was still healing from my C-section. And I would just go sit on the toilet to pee. And I remember looking out my bathroom window and it was this little square and I'm looking up at the sky like, this shit can't be real. Like we really are stuck in the house. This is some movie shit. This is really happening. And I remember like the days would be grayer and grayer and it, it would feel like I was really falling into a space of like depression. I knew it, I recognized it after so long and I never told anybody. And I think this is what kept me from my work. You know, I was mindful to at least write my son notes in his journal. I got a journal way before he was born, um, a handmade leaf journal. And I, I would write him notes if I was ever lonely. And then I got in the habit of not writing things that hurt me in that journal because I always want to go back and read what I wrote. And who wants to read anything depression, you know, depressive? So I would write things to him like, hey, you know, you did this today, you did that today, just to keep my mind focused on something creative. Um, and then I started creative journaling more. And that was a big thing I actually was able to pick back up um, and that was something I didn't have to discuss. I didn't have to talk to anybody about. Then I ended up writing a lesson about it and then being invited to teach it over the summer during COVID. Um, but it was hard. Like I really had to be honest with myself, like, yo, this is what you're dealing with. And you know, my background is art therapy, psychology and behavior modification. So it's like, definitely don't want to admit to something that you help other people admit too. Like, yo, this is, no, it's really happening to me. Cause there's no support. 
that I was alive. Like, I could have died before the pandemic having my baby. And I'm still making it through. I get tested every week. And I have not taken the vaccine. Shout out to all the people that have. And shout out to all the people, the homies that have not, that are holistic, because I'm a holistic girl. But I had to really honor what I was breathing. Breathing so simple, so simple. And you hear about people fighting for their lives on ventilators, like, that's it. Anything else is, is, is trivial to breathing. Like, I was still producing work, like projects, big projects, once I got out of my slump of um, postpartum and understanding, like, I wasn't alone, I had my baby. If I didn't have any other support, at least I had him. And he was teaching me new things about love and about compassion, not the cliche, oh, he's teaching me so much, no. I had to remember to learn how to smile at people. Like, and my son, I wrote that in a poem, that my, my son has taught me to smile back like that's not something because I'm always thinking I'm always in, in motion I'm always going I'm always thinking literally and he would just smile at me and I'm like I had to understand like am I loving him enough like I didn't come from a childhood of like understanding what love was like a lot of us but I really went through some tumultuous things like growing up that I healed from and I'm still currently healing from and you know having a home of love and consistency and care and compassion and communication was not what I came from. And then having a son, a woman, have a Umi having a son, and he's looking at me, he's smiling, and he wants to hold me and he wants to hug me, that's all something that was very foreign to me. I felt like the child that was abandoned getting into a new foster home and having to learn to trust my foster parents. My son is my parent. He really is my parent. Like, I'm really trying not to mess with my makeup, but he really is my parent. He teaches me so much. So that's my greatest form of wealth, is breathing and my son and all that other stuff is mixed in, you know? Man, I'm pimping in the trustworthiness. Like, I swear, like, I have to trust myself. Like. I mean, we could all do a multitude of things, but if you don't trust yourself and trust your work and be like, yo, my work is the illest or, you know, my skill set. Like I had to sit home and I was my biggest critic looking at my work, what work was hanging, what work was in books. And I think like I was talking to my, my sis Fayemi and she was like, queen, like, no, you shit. I'm like, what? And she's like, you really have to start respecting yourself. We have to have respect and not, again, that cliche is the biggest thing with 21. Respect yourself and what you do and where you are and where you're going. Like, I know I'm dope at a lot of shit, but to really honestly say like, I had to run down, I was on the phone with Miami and I had to run, I ran down some stuff. She's like, what are you most proud of? And I'm like, yo, I did this, I did that. I said, I've never really taken an inventory during 20 and 21. Of all the things I was doing, I just kept doing, virtually, obviously. And she said, "Yo, you, you the shit. You gotta respect. You gotta respect yourself and respect what you do." She said, "Cause if not, you just gonna be doing nothing, adding stuff to a resume that you don't really believe in." And I was like, "You right. That's Dr. Shakur. That's it. I don't." <laughs> you know, it was that simple.